This simple simulation of air molecules can be used to explain an important relationship in fluid mechanics, the relationship between pressure and velocity, or even more fundamentally, how pressure causes motion. It even explains supersonic expansion in rocket nozzles. Pressure is the result of collision forces between different molecules. If a molecule colliding with another of equal speed results in a certain force, then a molecule colliding with a slower molecule will result in a lower force. The center of mass of two molecules is a point halfway between them. When a fast molecule hits a slow one, their center of mass moves. If the center of mass keeps moving in the same direction time and again, it means the air is flowing. The two scenarios are not connected, at least not yet. What we're really after is to explain how you get from the condition of high pressure and no airflow to one where the air is flowing but at a lower pressure. In my previous video I explained the importance of relative speed and how the momentum transfer during a collision results in molecules swapping speed. I want to introduce the concept of a speed signal. It is a consequence of speed swapping over longer distances. Unlike thermal speed, which is measured relative to the local flow speed, I measure speed signals relative to a fixed point. In one dimension it is pretty straightforward. When a pair of molecules swap speed, it doesn't simply end there. The subsequent collisions continue to carry that speed down the line. You can picture it as a parcel of energy that is being passed from one molecule to the next. I call it a signal because it is how the energy state of molecules in one place is transmitted and able to influence molecules or surfaces elsewhere. So even in still air, these signals will travel back and forth, making sure everything stays nicely in equilibrium. Back to the earlier demonstration. This is what it looks like when comparing the speed signals between stationary air at high pressure and flowing air at lower pressure. Unless the row of flowing molecules is infinitely long, there must be a source of high speed signal somewhere to the left, and there must be a source of low speed signal somewhere to the right, which also absorbs the energy from the high speed signals because you don't see any of them being reflected back. Before the air could start flowing, those two source regions must at some point have been allowed to interact for the signals to be exchanged. In other words, there has to be a pressure difference before air starts flowing. This is how it happens. When the wall is removed, high speed signals no longer reflect back, but get passed on into the low pressure region. The same happens to the low speed signals. These are the last signals to have been reflected back from the wall. Three new regions have formed. Some high speed signals have penetrated beyond the last returning low speed signal, creating a region of higher density. On the opposite side, the last high speed signal is pulling away from the invading low speed signals, leaving a gap of low density. And in between, there is a stream of high speed signals meeting low speed signals going the opposite way, which you should now recognize as the pattern of steady airflow to the right. In two and three dimensions, speed signals don't travel in perfectly straight lines. I'm going to hide the slower molecules and add some trails to the fast ones. Every joint and change in direction is in fact a collision, where the speed signal is passed on from one molecule to the next. But eventually, every signal seems to disappear into thin air. That is because in two and three dimensions, some collisions are only glancing blows. A single high speed signal can be divided among multiple molecules. The result is that the speed signal can reach out sideways, and those signals can eventually reach backwards. In this demonstration, I give a single molecule entering the square a hard kick to the right, and you can clearly see how the signal fans out and curls back around. Something else worth mentioning is the similarity between a wall and a mirror image. Signals that are simply reflected of a stationary surface is the exact same result as molecules colliding with other molecules that exactly mirror their speed. Here is a solid boundary holding back the molecules and supporting the region's pressure. If the open space is replaced with a region of equal pressure, I can remove the boundary and the two regions will support each other's pressure even though the molecule's movements are not actually symmetrical. Without a solid boundary, signals will get exchanged with adjacent regions. If the conditions are the same in both regions, then for every signal that leaves one region, a signal of similar speed will replace it from the other side. The regions are still influencing each other, but since they are exchanging identical influence, the conditions in both remain the same. If the speed signals travel evenly in all directions, then no matter where I choose to draw the boundary, 
the regions on either side support each other's pressure through back and forth speed signals. But what if the regions have different pressures? Both regions here have equal density, but the one on the left has higher temperature so the molecules are colliding harder and more often. When the boundary is removed, speed signals from both regions start invading each other's territories. High speed signals shoot into the low pressure territory, but that leaves a high pressure region just behind them without returning signals. More high speed signals arrive from further to the left, but there are fewer high speed signals for them to collide with head on, and this means lower overall pressure in that area. You can still vaguely make out the regions of high and low density caused by the exchange. This color scheme indicates each molecule's collision forces averaged over its 10 most recent collisions. And this is the horizontal displacement over a time period to help indicate flow. It is difficult to get a proper picture by coloring individual molecules. So I've divided the area into a grid and calculated average values for flow speed in each cell. And I added all the collision forces to get an idea of pressure. The color band at the top is flow speed and the lower band is pressure. You will note that the high density region traveling to the right has a high pressure despite having a flow speed. That is not due to high collision forces, but simply due to the sheer number of collisions. At this point in time, the area further downstream has yet to receive an invading high speed signal, so the air has no flow and it is still at the original low pressure. Likewise, the region further upstream has yet to experience the lack of returning signals, so it remains unaffected. These affected regions will keep growing until they cover the entire length of the tube, or until they spill into some kind of pressure source, like a large tank. This is just a crude example of a high pressure tank. Here it is with flow speed on top and average collision forces at the bottom. When the valve is opened, the affected region expands, but when it reaches the end of the tube, there might be other processes involved, depending on how that region interacts with the air in the tank. This is again an example with the tanks at equal density. So there's going to be a high density pulse exiting into the low pressure tank, and there will be a low density region spilling into the high pressure tank. These disturbances cause their own return pulses, so it is quite a process before flow through the tube is steady. Note also that the high speed air leaving the tube is not at a lower pressure than the air around it. These two regions each has 10,000 molecules and equal pressure. The amount of different speed signals at any given time is the same as the different speeds of the molecules themselves. I've divided the overall speed range into 100 subranges and counted the number of molecules that fall into each range at a given time. The result is known as the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. If this represents air molecules, then the speed range with the most molecules will be somewhere around 1800 km an hour. The graph in green is the distribution of collision forces. An average collision force does not necessarily involve molecules of average speed. It could be any combination of different speeds depending on the angle of impact. Same with the low forces. A low force can result from a fast molecule hitting another that is just slightly slower but traveling in the same direction. Only the high collision forces are exclusive to head-on collisions between fast molecules. If pressure is increased by raising the temperature, then the distribution shifts to the right because the molecules are faster. Alternatively, a pressure difference can also result from a difference in density, even if the temperature is the same. An extreme case is, of course, when one side of the boundary is at a complete vacuum. When I mention a high pressure tank, you are more likely to be thinking about compressed air, in other words, high density air. Here the flow develops differently. If the air in a closed tank is the same temperature as the air outside, it will contain the same range of speed signals as the air outside, but there will be more of each. That means that when the valve is opened, only some of the molecules at the exit will exchange signals with air from outside. Based on this, you might think that the rest will simply rush straight out, but this is where things get interesting in two and three dimensions. Imagine a balloon in the vacuum of space. If the balloon is popped, the molecules blast outwards and very quickly the molecules furthest out 
are also those with a higher speed. At first glance, it appears obvious that the fastest molecules are going to be the ones expanding the fastest. Zooming into the center, it seems as if only the slowest molecules are left. In two dimensions, it's a little easier to see the speed signals in action. First look at the outer molecules. The molecules that were about to collide with the surface now just keep traveling outwards. High speed signals keep arriving from closer to the center and the molecules carrying them either shoot straight out or they pass that speed on to one of the slow molecules in the outer region. Either way, the faster signals always end up leading the expansion into new available space. No signals get reflected back. Little by little, every speed signal overtakes those slower than itself in the direction away from the center. This is called free expansion. Over time, as the molecules drift apart and the speed signals arrange themselves according to their speed, it behaves more like one-dimensional flow, and fast signals do not get redistributed sideways. When air vents into vacuum through a straight tube, the first molecules to leave get a clean break. Meanwhile, some slower signals also make their way down the tube. I have explained how the influence of a collision can spread sideways. As these slower signals get overtaken by fast signals, some of those collisions end up redistributing the high-speed signals sideways and backwards. Individual molecules travel against the flow only for a few individual collisions here and there before they are swept away, but those counterflowing speed signals remain in the tube and it restricts the speed inside the tube. This is known as choked flow. Here are only the molecules moving against the flow. You can see them even right at the exit. The amount of sideways motion at the exit is responsible for the way the molecules fan out as they leave. As long as the walls of the tube reflect those sideways signals directly back inwards, the flow will maintain the counter-flowing signals. Just as a side note, high-speed signals are obviously leaving the tank faster than the rest. If all the fast signals leave, then the average speed of the remaining molecules drops and the air in the tank gets colder and colder. This is again average flow speed and collision forces. The tube is packed with high speed signals, but they're all going roughly the same direction, which reduces collision forces. When I calculate the collision forces, I also take into account the times between collisions. Relative speed is all that matters for an individual collision. But if you want to get an idea of a molecule's contribution to pressure, you need to also consider how often it is colliding. One way to keep the flow accelerating is to create a conical exit, also called a diverging nozzle. Every time a sideways signal collides with a slanted tube wall, it gets reflected slightly more in the direction of the exit. This eliminates the slow signals that choke the flow in the straight tube, and flow can now go supersonic. Unlike the straight tube where collisions with the tube only exerted a sideways force, these collisions now also exert a component of force parallel to the flow. This is the additional thrust force that rockets gain by using such diverging nozzles. These are simple examples of how the geometry between two pressure sources can influence flow speed and pressure. The effect of the geometry on the flow is dependent on the pressure sources. Choked or supersonic flow only occurs when the outside is a vacuum or at a much lower pressure than in the tank. In a converging nozzle, the flow speeds up as it approaches the exit, but in the exit it is choked at the speed of sound. 